You know, uh, I, 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 a uh, few years ago, I, uh, I delivered a keynote address in Philadelphia. You remember it well. It was called The Arm of Flesh Shall Fail. Mm -hmm. And that address eventually became a book that we entitled Cry Mercy. And what I want to do tonight is revisit the theme of that book uh, with some freshness of vision that God has brought me over the years. And uh, to begin... I'd like to read a few lines for you from the first chapter of that book. Uh, the chapter is called The Hedge is Gone. You know, on September 11th, 2001, that was a day that everything changed for America. But I often wonder how many of us fully understand what it was that changed. And I don't think many of us do. So let me let me read a few lines from that first chapter, and then I'll share with you what uh, what God's been laying on my heart. I stood in horror as I watched the second plane home in like a missile into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. I wept openly. I stood in the, in the middle of my living room and I wept at the magnitude of what I was watching gripped my mind and heart. And I realized this was no accident. America was under attack. It was a terrifying thing to watch, but I couldn't turn away, even as desperate men and women were leaping to their deaths from 60 stories high, rather than to be consumed by the raging inferno that was upon them. News reports came of another plane striking the Pentagon and another crashing into a field in Pennsylvania. And as the sting of tears streamed down my face, I heard so clearly the Spirit of God say, the hedge is gone. Mm -hmm. After more than 200 years of basking in the favor of God, the invoice of our national rebellion had come due. It was not simply that we had been attacked, but that God had allowed the attack. Because until that moment, America stood alone, unique from the rest of the world. There seemed to be a hedge of protection that, that sealed and sheltered us from the kinds of violence other places endure on a regular basis. I believe we foolishly believe that it was our great military might that had so long protected us, when in fact, it was the impenetrable hand of God. And on September 11th, 2001, that hand of protection was withdrawn and the waiting hand of hatred struck the blow that it had been poised to deliver for generations. But until then, our enemies had never been able to penetrate the protective hand of providence. In those early morning hours of 9-11, the jihadists delivered a message to America. It was a message they had verbalized for years. We hate America and all that it represents. And whenever and wherever we can, we will strike at the heart of you. Now, we heard that message. We got that message loud and clear. But there was another message that was delivered that day, a message that most Americans could not hear. It was a long delayed message from a holy God who was saying to us, I will no longer protect you. I have removed my hedge from around you. Your shores are now exposed to the nations who have for so long sought to strike at you. But because of me, they could not. Now, as the years have passed since the carnage of that day, I've watched America as we have responded to the message of the jihadists with bombs and missiles. We've sent brave soldiers into the deserts, mountains, and caves of Afghanistan and Iraq to hunt down and destroy those who would do us harm. I've witnessed billions of dollars spent, countless lives lost, untold destruction, unleashed upon towns and villages in retaliation to the message we received from those 19 men in New York, in Washington, and Shanksville on that day. Yeah, we responded to the terrorist. 
but we have yet to acknowledge the greater message, the more critical message of that day, a message from God that to this day has remained relatively unheard and unheeded. Now, biblical history tells us that when God seeks to get the attention of his people, whether it be through the voice of a prophet or through some calamity, and his voice is ignored or disregarded, he will speak again, and he will speak more loudly. I believe if this nation, which was raised up by God, established by God, blessed by God, sustained by God, protected by God, continues to turn a deaf ear to his pleas, there will be another 9-11 and another and another until we learn that God's grace has a time stamp. And the time stamp on God's grace toward America may be nearing its expiration date. Over the last few weeks, as I've prayed for God's guidance in preparing this address, I realized that over and over again in the Holy Scriptures, we see a pattern in God's dealings with men. We see those patterns so clearly in the nation of Israel, who is in fact God's pattern for the nations. I really appreciate Marty's comments. We are so tied to the nation of Israel. It's so simple. I can sum it up for us in just three words. Grace, judgment, mercy. The operation of that pattern is equally simple. God gives grace. Well, grace is a gift. Grace is such a beautiful gift. It's unearned, undeserved, not for sale. But if that gift is despised, forgotten, or ignored, God will bring judgment. Now, God's purpose in judgment is to drive us to the place where we will remember that our existence, our safety, our peace, our prosperity are a gift from God, the grace of God. And in that remembrance, we might repent, repent of our forgetfulness and cry out to God for mercy. Grace, judgment, mercy. And if there is no cry for mercy, judgment will persist, it will intensify, and ultimately it will end in our destruction. You know, it was an act of grace that sent Moses into Egypt to rescue God's people. God said, I have heard the cry of my people by reason of their taskmasters, and I have come down to deliver them. It was grace that the chariots of Pharaoh were lost in the Red Sea. And it was grace that caused manna to rest upon the ground every day. It was grace that sweetened the bitter waters of Marah. And it was grace that caused water to flow from a rock to quench their thirst. And when the Hebrew children stood before the receding waters of the Jordan River, looking over into Canaan, they beheld grace the gift of a homeland. The grace of God was upon them every step of the way. <clears throat> you will allow me. I want to remind us of the words of Moses as Israel stood on the banks of the Jordan, preparing to enter in and to possess this remarkable gift of grace, which would be their forever home. Words from the eighth chapter of Deuteronomy. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs, flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills you can dig copper. And you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. 
take care. Lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I commanded you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied, <coughs> excuse me, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of a flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and my might, the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers, as it is in this day. If you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods to serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today, that you shall surely perish like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so you shall perish because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. In these words, we so very clearly see the grace of God on the children of Abraham. We also see the promise of judgment if they should forget God. I remind us today that Israel did, in fact, forget God. They did turn their backs upon God. They did blaspheme his name and turn to other gods. They not only ignored the warnings from the prophets, they killed the prophets. They laughed, they mocked, they scorned, they made jokes. They lived as if there was no God. Until one day, Nebuchadnezzar rode in from the east. And Israel learned that God's grace has a time stamp. And they had run out of time. Their cities lie in ruin. Their temple was destroyed. Their children carried off in captivity to a faraway land that neither knew nor regarded their God. They had forgotten God. Seventy years passed and their dry, broken, and desperate hearts sat down by a riverside in Babylon as they wept for Jerusalem. And it was by that faraway river that they cried out to God for mercy, and he heard their cry. Well, I want to hasten to make my point. It was grace that guided the Mayflower and its 102 passengers to a bay near what is now called Massachusetts. They were seeking a haven in which they could worship God in accordance with their conscience. Grace sailed with them as they traversed stormy seas, ultimately to land upon a rock in a place we call Plymouth. It was grace that sustained that tiny settlement through that first harsh winter. It was grace that gave us men like Franklin, Adams, Jefferson, and Washington, and so many more, to take up the cause of liberty. God gave us a gift, a gift of the most amazing founding documents, built entirely upon the precepts of the Holy Scriptures themselves as a foundation for a fledgling nation. It was grace that allowed a ragtag, untrained, poorly armed militia of farmers and clergymen to stand against and turn back the greatest army of its time. And as our forefathers stood on the crest of the Appalachian Mountains looking westward, they beheld a land that can only be described as a good land, a land of brooks and water, of fountains and springs flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines 
and olive vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills you can dig copper, and you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. This great land that we love so deeply is nothing less than a gift from God. And when the pilgrims landed and all who followed them, my ancestors and yours, they beheld, their eyes beheld our own Canaan, our own promised land. That was our gift. That was our grace. Sadly, like Israel, America has forgotten God. We have swelled with pride in our own achievement, believing in ourselves more than God, trusting in ourselves more than God, seeking wealth, comfort, pleasure, fame more than we seek God, and forgetting that it was God who brought us here. Now Israel turned their backs on Yahweh, the God who delivered them out of Egypt, and they followed after the gods from whom they had been forbidden. They forsook Jehovah Jireh, the provider, and sought, often, sought after Asheroth, the goddess of fertility and perversion. They turned their backs upon the God of life and sought to appease Baal, the God of fire and child sacrifice. To worship Asheroth was to engage in unrestrained sexual perversion, orgies at the gate of her temple. And of course, later, months later, would come hordes of unwanted babies who were then thrown into the fiery arms of Baal and Molech in hopes that he would reward them with bountiful crops. Well, my friend, not much has changed. Our own nation has descended into a wanton pursuit of sexual perversion, sexualizing our children at increasingly young ages, introducing them to every form of sexual fantasy and perversion imaginable. And as the resulting wave of unwanted children are conceived, they are offered to the patron saint of the abortion industry, Baal himself, and hopes he will provide them with great wealth, which he does to the tune of billions and billions of dollars. The nation has turned her back on the Creator God to worship the creation that God made. This, of course, is right out of the first chapter of the book of Romans, where the Apostle Paul said they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator. I tell you, the most prominent religion in America today is environmentalism. As America turn, has turned away from Father God to bow down before Mother Nature, the same strident voices that cry out to save the forest, to protect the spotted owl, to preserve the blue whale, to guard the breeding grounds of the kangaroo rat. These are the same voices that have built an entire political platform upon the right of a mother to abort her child. We have thousands of square miles dedicated to preserving some furry creatures' nesting grounds, while our children lie in pieces ripped out of a mother's womb and tossed into a trash can. It would seem the only form of life that is not sacred in America is the life of a human child. These are not the actions of a sane spiritual people. These are the actions of a people who have been overtaken by the insanity of self. And we are ruled now by a political system that has been invaded by the vilest of demonic forces. We call Hitler a madman. We call Stalin a butcher. We cringe at Pol Pot, who murdered a quarter of Cambodia's population. While in the name of women's rights, Christian America has participated in the butchery of more than 70 million innocent babies, calling our next generation products of conception parasites. We are infuriated when Muslims call us infidels. Barack Obama once declared, America is no longer a Christian nation to the disdain of many. Well, an infidel is an unbeliever, 
And a Christian is one who follows the teachings of Christ. Based upon those definitions, one must consider that we have indeed become a nation of infidels and no longer a nation where the word of God is welcomed, much less followed. Congressman Jerry Nadler stood on the floor of the House and declared what any religious tradition describes as God's will is of no concern to this Congress. What a stark contrast to those 56 men who affixed their signatures to the Declaration of Independence, fully convinced that they were moved by the hand and carried by the will of God. What a difference from April 30th, 1789, when newly inaugurated President George Washington and the entire Congress of the United States marched down the street from Federal Hall in New York City to St. Paul's Chapel, where they knelt together and entered our nation into a covenant with God. It should not bewilder us, bewilder us when we learn that on September 11, 2001, as both towers of the World Trade Center collapsed into a pile of dust, the only building that was left standing was St. Paul's Chapel. My friends, America has become more than a nation of infidels. We are a nation of covenant breakers. Only the mercy of God can save our nation. Now, we've all heard that Alexa de Tocqueville, in writing about colonial America, said, America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. That's an amazing quote. However, its eloquence is magnified when we read it in its context. And I'll do that for you now. He says this. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her commodious harbors and her ample rivers. It was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her fertile fields and boundless forest, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her rich mines and her vast world commerce, and, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her public school system and her institutions of learning, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America and her democratic Congress and her matchless constitution. It, it was not there. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. Now, I have a little bit of a difference with Alexa, because this is my view of America. America is not now, nor has she ever been great. America is not great, my friend. America is blessed. Any greatness we may experience is directly owned by the one who raised this nation up. We should not seek to be known for our greatness, but for our gratefulness, gratitude to the God who brought the pilgrims to the shores of Massachusetts, an embryo of a nation such as the world has never beheld, raised up as a city on a hill, a shining light to the world, a sender of ships to the corners of the earth, bearing the gospel of Christ to the nations. Instead, we are swallowed up in pride, believing that we are great by our own hand, rich by our own effort, filled with things because that's what it's all about. We have forgotten God. 9-11 was a message from God. Do not forget me. And God continues to speak. Flooded cities, entire communities turned into piles of rubble by unprecedented swarms of tornadoes. 
global pandemic, separating families, shutting down education, destroying businesses, failing economics, homelessness, poverty, hungry. An entire generation of our children are desperate and desperately confused. Like the new children of Israel, they've been carried away into captivity. They don't know who they are. They don't even know what they are. The prophets of perversion have been leashed, unleashed upon them. They are being educated by drag queens, anarchists, and terrorists. Divisions in our nation and enemies on every side rattling their swords. And all these problems could be solved if you would just buy an electric car. Friends, these are not the results of global warming. This is a global warning. And God is saying, can you hear me now? On November 5th, we will hold an important election, perhaps one of the most significant in our lifetime. But an election will not repair the damage that has been done to this nation, and it will not forestall future damage. Unless, unless of course it restores our hearing so that once again, we can hear God's voice. The judgment of God will continue to press upon this nation until we are so desperate, until we are so desperate from the pressure it brings that we cry out for mercy or until we are completely destroyed. Now, <clears throat> as a pastor of 55 years, I'm compelled to consider our position from my own unique perspective. In the case of ancient Israel, it was the religious crowd that drowned out the voice of God. It was the prophets, the priest, and the princes, the government, that refused to heed the warnings of men like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and so many others. Those very men who were called by God to communicate the voice of God, to declare the word of God, to seek the welfare of the people of God, those very men either sat in stony silence or actually lifted up strident voices of opposition in an effort to drown out the words of the prophets. In Ezekiel 22, God said to the young prophet, speaking to the prophets, to the priest, and to the princes, the politicians, I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. He goes on to say, Therefore, I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Imagine, God searched the hearts of his prophet. He searched the hearts of his priest. He, he hopefully searched the hearts of those in political power, looking for a, a man who would stand in the gap against God's judgment. Sad commentary. I found none. Sadly, there are too many men who stand behind pulpits today or perhaps more to the point in front of cameras, who wear robes and collars and crosses around their necks, often more performer than preacher, more hip than holy. They cry, they carry Bibles and they speak in eloquent and convincing words and tones while they elevate their own station, enrich their own pockets and declare as did the false prophets of ancient Israel, our best days are yet ahead. Now tonight I speak a warning to all of us, but especially to those so-called prophets of prosperity and perversion. One day, we will all stand before God and give an account for our ministry. Son of man, he said to the prophet Ezekiel, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, no, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. 
But if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die for his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. Again, if a righteous person turns from his righteousness and commits injustice, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because you have not warned him, he shall die for his sin, and his righteous deeds that he has done shall not be remembered. But his blood I will require at your hand. This nation awaits a new election in the trembling hope things will get better. We watch the stock market, and we hear the voice of the prognosticators in hopes of better gain. Many go to church or to a temple or a synagogue or a mosque, hungry for a word of hope for tomorrow. God is speaking that word of hope. But where are the voices of the prophets who will declare what God is saying? God is saying, remember me. Return to me. Cry out to me. And I will answer with great mercy. This is what I believe that God is saying to us today, and I am privileged to have been able to share this message with you. Thank you very much, Marlene, for the invitation to speak at this conference. Return to me, God says, and I will answer. God bless you all.